light lives in us, in our hearts. His light is that unseen hand that guides our lives. Good morning and welcome to First Baptist Church. It is so good to have you here in worship. Please note that the tithes and offering may be placed in the boxes at the exit. We will miss the organ today due to a current maintenance and repair project. Our service includes a sermon that continues a series based on the book of Genesis, dealing today with the life of Joseph. Let us join together now and for prayer. Loving God, thank you for the assurance we have that you are with us regardless of circumstances. Thank you for the story of Joseph and the way you brought good out of what appeared to be hopeless circumstances. May we trust in you the same way in our own lives. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now let us use the music of the prelude to help prepare ourselves for worship. Please join me in our call to worship. Almighty God, creator of all we have and are, we thank you that your love for us transcends our imagination. We praise you for your faithfulness to us in good times and bad. Like Joseph, may we trust you to bring good even out of periods of our lives that are the most difficult. This morning our hymn is Like a River Glorious. You'll find the text in your worship guide. We encourage you, rather than, than singing full voice, to, uh, to hum, or if you're wearing a mask, to sing softly. And pay special attention to the words, which are so appropriate for today and in these days in which we live. Like a river glorious is God's perfect peace. Stayed upon Jehovah, hearts are fully blessed finding, as he promised, perfect peace and rest. May we stand together, please.
morning, my friends. It's so good to see you today. So today I brought with me a coat. It's kind of fancy. See all these little gold tassels, all the different colors. So our Bible story today is about a man named Joseph. You might have heard about him before. He had lots of brothers who were very jealous of him because they thought their dad loved Joseph more than they loved them. So one day, their father gave Joseph a beautiful coat of many colors, kind of like this one maybe, and the brothers were so jealous. Then, a little while later, Joseph had a dream, and in this dream, his brothers bowed down before him. When Joseph told his brothers about the dream, it just made them hate him even more. So you know what Joseph's brothers did? They made a plan to get rid of Joseph. They took Joseph's coat and they threw Joseph in a deep hole in the ground. And as they were trying to decide what to do next, some travelers came by on their way to Egypt and the brothers sold Joseph to them for 20 pieces of silver. So Joseph found himself in a bad spot. He was hated by his brothers. He had been sold into slavery, and he was being taken to Egypt. Even though Joseph was going through some really hard times, God was still with him. God took all those bad things that had happened to Joseph, and God made good come of it. You see, Joseph ended up with a really important job in Egypt. He was responsible for storing all the extra food during the harvest and then distributing that food to people in need during the time of famine. So many years later, after Joseph's brothers had sold him, they came to Egypt to get food. And when Joseph saw his brothers, he forgave them. I think Joseph knew that even though you can't control the things that happen to you in life, you can control how you act towards those things. Joseph continued to rely on God even through the hard times in life, and that is a good life lesson for all of us. I want us to join together for a time of prayer, then after the prayer. Hansley will lead us in the Lord's Prayer. Ever-present and ever-loving God, our prayer today is a response to your constant love. When we wake up to each new day, you're there to greet us. When sleepless nights and worried moments toss us, you're there to comfort us. When difficult choices confuse us, you're there to guide us. You've loved us even before we turned to you. And you're here now, and for that we are grateful. So we place before you our lives, our, our frag sometimes fragmented, busy, tired lives. We seem to catch only glimpses of joy and beauty. So save us from hurry and worry. We place before you our church serving in Christ's name, spreading the gospel, caring for the hurting, and visiting those who are in need. Teach us to trust you and fill us with your love so that we can spread the old, old story. We place before you our world, our troubled world, broken and fighting, yearning for peace, yearning for freedom, suffering drought, hunger, and greed. Teach us the path of peace and the ways of sharing. Ever-present, ever-loving God, thank you for hearing our prayer, and thank you for your amazing grace. We pray now in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, 
us to deliver us from our evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Joseph's Chartreuse Fuchsia Blazer. Some men have 12 sons, but only see one. Joseph's daddy, Jacob, gave him a wild new chartreuse blue fuchsia hot pink blazer. It glowed like an electric cherry, a glittering supercharged rainbow of light. Its collar was made of lightning bright lasers. His coat was truly a high voltage blazer. Joseph's plain brothers were very upset because their dad, Jacob, made Joseph his pet. Yes, Judah, Issachar, Reuben, and Dan, and Asher, and Levi were mad to a man. It's bad, said Gad, that Jacob, our dad, treats Joseph as though he's the one son he's had. I'm wearing a jacket, an old hand-me-down. It's soiled and dirty and ragged and torn, said Judah. I had it when Joseph was born. I've patched it six times and the zipper is broken. What can dad mean giving Joseph this coat? Then Joseph came by in his video cloak, which glowed in the dark like a star. Look, fellas, you're jealous. Just admit it. My garment's radioactive. Like, ref right, like reflective, sorry. <laughs> a jolt of a coat, an electric grid weave. I'm a live neon Leon in a hot double breaster with high amperage sleeves. Enough is enough, said Reuben the Rough. The story goes badly, I'm sorry to tell. Joseph the Proud wound up in a well. Slavery was his lot with no coat of his own. His old grieving father felt very alone. The brothers were selfish, still you should take note that if ever you're given a high voltage coat, don't flaunt it at those who have barely a stitch. When everyone's wearing a cheap threadbare coat, you're smart to avoid a high voltage bloat. This morning's scripture comes from Genesis chapter 37, verses 1 through 6 and 18 through 28. Jacob settled in the land where his father had lived as an alien, the land of Canaan. This is the story of the family of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was shepherding the flock with his brothers. He was a helper to the sons of Bela and Silpah, his father's wives, and Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any other of his children because he was the son of his old age and he had made him a long robe with sleeves. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Once Joseph had a dream and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, listen to this dream that I dreamed. They saw him from a distance, and before he came near to them, they conspired to kill him. They said to one another, Here comes this dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we shall say that a wild animal has devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. But when Reuben heard it, he delivered him out of their hands, saying, Let us not take his life. Reuben said to them, Shed no blood. Throw him into this pit here in the wilderness, but lay no hand on him that he might rescue him out of their hand and restore him to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the long robe with sleeves that he wore, and they took him and threw him into a pit. The pit was empty. There was no water in it. Then they sat down to eat, and looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead, with their camels carrying gum, balm, and resin on their way to carry down to Egypt. Then Judah said to his brothers, What profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. The brothers agreed. When some Midianite traders passed by, 
they drew Joseph up, lifting him out of the pit, and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver, and they took Joseph to Egypt. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Perhaps some of you saw the, the carpool karaoke a couple years ago. James Corden and Paul McCartney were riding around Liverpool in James Corden's car talking about different sites and different experiences that the Beatles had. And they got on the song Let It Be and, and Paul McCartney said, we were going through a rough stretch as a Beatles group and uh, he, said, he, he said, I was worried about it and I went to sleep one night I had a dream. In the dream, my mother, Mary, uh, came to me and said, it's going to be okay. Just let it be. So I woke up the next morning and wrote that song. Mother Mary came to me, comes to me speaking words of wisdom. Let it be. We're going to try to find some words of wisdom today about this rough stretch that we're in, about God's plan, God's providence, God's care through this biblical story and this COVID-19 experience. A friend said it to me over breakfast. I've known this man a long time. He said to me something over breakfast, <clears throat> and I don't agree with what he said. He's a Christian. Uh, what he said that I don't agree with is this. If God is not in control of everything, then he's not in control of anything. If God is not in control of everything, then he's not in control of anything. That will look good on a bumper sticker. It'll get some amens in church. I don't think it holds up under scrutiny. I think we need to drop the Christian cliches and bumper stickers. They're not working. When he said to me, if God is not in control of everything, he's not in control of anything, I said to myself, God's not in control of me. I'm not a puppet. God's not pulling my strings. I make decisions every day, some good and some bad. Remember the sermon last week, Genesis 3 story? That's my story, your story. Bad decision. Because of those bad decisions, we all now live east of Eden. God is not sending a virus that kills thousands of people or controlling somebody who decides to, to drink and drive and kills innocent people. What kind of mean God would do that? I wish I could believe what the man said to me because it makes life so simple. You don't have to do, think about much. There's no uncertainty in your thought, your theology. It's pretty simple. I have a lot of friends who believe what he said, but I don't. I never have. Enter today's story. A lot of bad things happen in this story. A lot of bad decisions are made and consequences for those bad decisions. So Joseph is one of the 12 sons of Jacob. He's the favored son of Jacob. Don't ever do that. If you have more than one child, don't ever favor one over the other. You're going to be asking for trouble, big trouble, if you do that. Uh, born late in life to Jacob's favorite wife, Rachel. Don't do that either. If you have a wife, don't have a favorite wife. In those days, they practiced polygamy. Everybody did. Men had several wives. But he made a mistake having a favored wife. So there's some mistakes happening in this story you can notice. And so Jacob gives to his favorite son this beautiful coat, coat of many colors, long sleeves coat. Other boys get hand-me-downs. Again, don't do that. It's not smart. So Joseph naturally gets the big head, tells his brothers, hey, guys, I had a dream. In my dream, you serve me. Ha, ha. Can't wait for that, can you? Don't ever do that, being the favorite son. Don't tell your siblings you had a dream and they're going to serve you. If you do, they're going to leave you for dead, which is what they did. At first, put him in a pit. 
where there's no water, and Reuben thinks, I'll come back later and save him. Then they say, don't kill him, no. They'll just sell, sell him into slavery, into Egypt. We'll never see him again. He'll die in slavery in Egypt. In a sense, Joseph had it coming. He was an arrogant, spoiled kid. Some of the bad stuff in life we bring on ourselves, right? Make bad decisions. Genesis chapter 3. He reminds me of Uncle Buddy. Uncle Buddy lived in Mississippi <coughs> down the road from Aunt Louise. Uncle Buddy loved to play practical jokes on everybody. He was always up to no good. Well, L Aunt Louise had a dog named Sputnik. This was back in the 50s, so you might remember Sputnik, the Soviet satellite in the 50s. You remember that? Not raise your hand if you remember the Soviet satellite in the 50s, all right? Named Sputnik. Sputnik was meaner than Khrushchev's mother-in-law. He would chew on Achilles tendons, gnaw on ankle bones, and, and rip calf muscles. He had fangs as long as drinking straws. He chewed on everybody except family. They had an agreement with Sputnik. They would sleep under the steps and Sputnik had the house. So Uncle Buddy, the prankster, came across the ugliest, scariest Halloween mask you have ever seen. And Aunt Louise was scared to death of ghosts and goblins and Uncle Buddy made it his business to know that. So come Halloween night, darkness falls, Uncle Buddy is lurking on the front porch with that mask on. Aunt Louise comes out the front door onto the porch. The spook lunges at Aunt Louise. Aunt Louise nearly passes out, nearly faints. She gathers herself before she falls. And the last thing Uncle Buddy remembers that night is Aunt Louise screaming, sicking Sputnik. Joseph had it coming. His brother sold him into slavery. He wound up in Egypt. He remained there 27 years. 27 years had passed. They probably still had his picture on the fridge. Oh, poor Joseph sold him. To, didn't tell, they lied to their dad about what happened to him. He spent 17 of those years in prison in Egypt for something he did not do. He was accused of an immoral act. He didn't do it. 17 years in prison. DNA evidence got him out of prison. We hear so much today about justice, lack of justice. Joseph was an innocent man who was falsely accused. They had not seen their brother in 37 years. So he got out of prison, and because he had become a really, he's a really sharp guy, he got into the, the government of Egypt and began to rise in power until he became the number two guy in all of Egypt making him probably the second most powerful person in the world. He also in charge of, of food supply for the whole country of Egypt. Well, as the story goes, there's a famine in Israel, so the brothers had to go to Egypt to beg for food. So guess who they got to go see? Their brother, they haven't seen him in 37 years. And he's probably, his appearance has probably changed. Probably got a little pot belly now, lost his hair, got some funky glasses, and wearing a really nice suit with matching tie and hanky because he's the number two guy in Egypt. So they go in to see him, to beg for food. And they don't recognize him, but he knows who they are. And so he says to them, hey guys, you know who I am? They go, no. Then he tells them who he is. And they go, uh-oh, uh-oh, we're in big trouble. But he had grown up to be a great man. He offered them forgiveness and grace. And they, they hugged each other and cried and wept. This is one of the great stories in the Bible. And Joseph is one of the few good people in the Old Testament. He grew up to be a great, great person. So he showed unbelievable grace and forgiveness to his brothers. He could have had them all killed or tortured, but he loved them. And, and he blessed his family. So years later, he's looking back on his life, that 2020 hindsight, and says to his brothers, this is chapter 50, verse 20, uh, that's in your bulletin as a meditation today. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. Us older folks, we can look back on life from a different perspective, and we can see how life 
uh, changed for us and the good things that came out of the bad. Young folks don't have that advantage. We got some wisdom because we have a, we've had some experiences that you haven't have, so that usually gives us a little bit of wisdom. Does that mean that all things that happen to us are good? No and heck no. Ask the, the health care workers at any hospital. There's much evil in this world, and please hear me this morning when I say God doesn't do evil or cause evil to happen. Now, you can read the Old Testament. You see some of that in the Old Testament. God's sending plagues and things. That's Old Testament thinking. It's not Jesus thinking. It's not the way Jesus taught or lived. Did Jesus ever put suffering on anybody? Did, did Jesus ever put diseases on anybody? No. The answer is no. Read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. No and heck no. But all that happens to us is not good. But God can take whatever comes our way evil and make good out of it. Uh, I have friends in Carrollton who say to me, they believe that whatever happens to us is God's will. I don't believe that. Never have believed it. Not going to believe it. I wish life and theology were that simple. If you believe that, then you don't have to do any critical thinking. You don't have any uncertainty about life. You just say whatever happens. Well, it was God's will. I don't say that. But I do believe that God can wring whatever good can be wrung from whatever happens to us. You've had a wet towel before. You're trying to wring the water out of it. You know how you just squeeze it and squeeze it? I believe that God can squeeze whatever last drop of good that can come out of whatever happens to us. So most of us, looking back on our lives, can see the hand of God upon our lives. What I hope you will do this morning is believe in the unseen hand of God upon your life. It's harder when you're young. When you're older, you can look back on it and you see a different perspective. But you have a choice in life to become bitter or better when whatever happens to you. I'm thinking today about the high school seniors who just graduated. It was a rough year for those seniors in high school. I mean, it was, it was really hard on lots of them. I'm, I see Paige Blackman here today, and she had it rough of all because she's a great athlete. She had injuries senior year. But those seniors had a choice to become bitter or better. I think they're very resilient kids. And they, they learned some lessons through that experience. I see Mason Deal back there as well, a senior just graduated. Uh, what do you do with what happened to you? You didn't choose it. I don't think God sent it. Do you become bitter or better about it? And God bless them as they've made their way through that. You see life better in the rearview mirror. And, and I just had a birthday, so I got a lot of rearview mirror. I had a lot of looking back in my life that I can do now that I couldn't do when I was 18. Natalie's driving now, got a car. And it, every car now, I guess, has that mirror on the passenger side that says objects in mirror are closer than they appear. I go, huh? <laughs> I want to know how much closer, you know? I got an 18-wheeler over here. Perspective, and those mirrors are supposed to give you some perspective on life. I believe that God was preparing Joseph for life experiences down the road. So a question for you this morning. How is the COVID-19 experience changing you? It's going to make you better or bitter? Will it be the same old you? When it's all said and done, will you be the same person you were before it started? The difficult times were humbling Joseph. He needed to be humbled. What about these difficult times? Are they humbling you in any way? Are they changing your perspective on what's really important in life? Are you going to be any different on the other side of this experience? Uh, Joseph did not all of a sudden become a great guy that you read about in the Bible. But God in his wisdom was shaping Joseph through life experience. An, ang an arrogant, spoiled brat became a man of great principle and great humility. Do you recall when you learned to ride a bicycle and they first took the training wheels off your bike? It's kind of a big day. I had, the, I had a great bicycle. I had a Huffy convertible. Anybody had a Huffy convertible back from the day? That was a great bicycle. And Dad took the training wheels off. And I was at the house by myself, and I decided today's the day I'm going to ride this bicycle. And our driveway was not long, but it was pretty steep. And I recall the feeling, still got the feeling, of getting on that bicycle for the first time without training wheels and starting down that driveway. And a sense of panic set in. 
Because, you know, the fears are, if I turn, I'm going to fall. I didn't want to fall. Or if I hit the brakes, I haven't ever stopped without the training wheels. I'm going to fall if I hit the brakes. So I didn't either. I didn't turn. I didn't hit the brakes. I went straight down that driveway across the street, and there was an empty field across it, hit the curb, threw me over the handlebars, and I got up and dusted myself off, felt like Superman. I'd done it, you know. So what's better, having that experience without training wheels or taking your bike to college with the training wheels on it? How many of you want to ride around the green belt for the rest of your life with the training wheels on your bicycle? Probably not. I think it's better to take our, our falls and take our tumbles, take our medicine, and learn some lessons about riding bikes and learn some lessons about life. You probably know this about giraffes. You've been to the zoo, watched giraffes, interesting creatures, aren't they? What the mother does when her baby is born and her baby struggles to get up off the ground, the mother kicks her down. As the baby tries again to get up, the mother kicks the baby down again and again because for survival in the wild, the baby has to get up quickly and stay with the herd or they're going to be lunch for a lion or a leopard. I don't think God is kicking you down. That's way too Old Testament-ish for me. I don't think Jesus kicks you down. But I do believe he's there with you when you fall to lift you up and teach you some lessons about life and prepare you for what's next in your life. So I believe that God loves you, that God is good, that he loves me and you. And many times... At the time, we don't understand what's happened to us. Sometimes we never know why, even in hindsight. I attended a funeral a few years ago where the preacher said some very interesting words. He said this, God is too kind to do anything cruel. God is too wise to make a mistake. God is too deep to explain himself. Come to think of it, that might make a great bumper sticker. Let us pray. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you today to worship you, to praise you, to thank you. We're going through periods of our life with COVID-19 and all the riots and things in the world, and, and it, it concerns us, but we know that you're here and you're with us. And our responsibility at First Baptist Church is we see with all the members of our church reaching out and their light shining for you in the community. And we thank you for that. As we bring our tithes and offerings to you, please use it to glorify your name and give you all the glory. It's in your precious name that I pray. Amen. <laughs>
Thank you. Just a few uh, quick announcements. Uh, our custom the last several years has been to have one worship service in July. We'll continue that this year, except it's going to be at 11 o'clock and not 10. We've done 10 o'clock sometimes in July. This, this year it's going to be 11 o'clock. So if you think about coming to 830, don't in July. Hope you will come to 11. And uh, if we have more than we can handle, we'll have an overflow in the fellowship hall. Got that set up in case that were to happen. Uh, anyway, a lot of people are traveling in July. We know that, but we'll have worship. And hope. thank you for being a part of this worship today. Hope you have a wonderful fourth next weekend, celebrating here or wherever you're going to be. Uh, I'm going to be out of town. I'm going to the beach Tuesday with a bunch of 17-year-olds. Wish me luck. Uh, Christopher will be preaching next Sunday, and, and he's a really good communicator. You know that. He takes seriously preaching. I like listening to him, so hope you'll come support him and, and be here for worship next Sunday. Again, thank you for being here. Good to see you. I wish we could hug. We'll do some elbow taps and those kind of things, but thank you for being here. Great to see the kids here and all of you. Thanks for worshiping with us. Please stand for our benediction. As you depart from worship today, believe in the unseen hand of God upon your life and trust God to lead you and to teach you life lessons as you go. We're a people called First Baptist Church, caring people, sharing God's love.